Good morning. I um, am so excited to be here. I actually sent this to all of uh, my close friends because uh, this is the most exciting topic when it comes to real estate investing. Hence so why I decided to wear my party dress, uh, Patrick. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. It's like a Zoom, like put on whatever spouse, hurry up, jump on the, <laughs> jump on the, uh, the video chat. Um, so good morning, good morning, lab quote agents. I'm Vanessa Noble here in Anchorage, Alaska, and I am with one of my favorite um, people to talk about real estate investing, and that is Patrick Kappel, um, agent in San Diego. Um, good morning, Patrick. Hey, Vanessa, good morning. How are you doing up in Alaska? I'm doing amazing, and we are getting our panelists uh, that are joining us. Good morning. I see Paula and Wesley, and there is several dozen others. Um, I don't know where they're from, but good morning. Um, Maxwell, hey, what's up? Good morning. I um, So today, what we promised people we would talk about is how to reduce our tax liability through real estate investing. And one of the crazy things that I um, came into when I started to uh, run in the circles with um, a lot of the real estate investors and multifamily syndicators is um, that m many of them had gone years and years without paying taxes. And mm -hmm. to a real estate professional, um, where we typically give up a third of our gross commission income, um, and if that sounds like hundreds of thousands of dollars to you, uh, it's painful. Um, and so, um, what can we do and how can we as a real estate professional have advantages in the real estate investing market where we can offset some of that tax liability? Because when I started to hear about this, I mean, I was like, this, ha this can't be true. Like, why hasn't anybody told me about this? I've been in real estate seven years. So um, let's, let's, let's hear it. Talk to me. You study yeah. real estate, I mean, taxes in your sleep, basically. That's like your bedtime story. Okay. Yeah, I enjoy taxes. So I'm wearing my UCLA shirt today because I used to uh, teach taxation as an undergrad student. I was a teaching assistant, um, or excuse me, as a graduate student, I was a teaching assistant, um, TA as they're known, and I did really well my first year there in my tax course. So the professor said, help me teach it next, <laughs> next year. And we always said the only thing better than making money is saving money, not paying it to the tax man. Um, because as you know, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. Right. So Vanessa, you couldn't have said it any better. You said, uh, you mentioned that you spoke with a lot of uh, real estate investors who have gone years without paying taxes. Yes. And there's only two people I know that have gone years without paying taxes. People committing tax fraud that are in jail, or maybe <laughs> not in jail yet, and real estate investors who are doing it legally. Right. Real estate is one of the few ways I know of where you can avoid or at the at least minimize your tax burden. Awesome. I mean, this has like been at the forefront of politics uh, with Donald Trump. Um, I'm not going to say if I like him or don't like him, but I will say this. I'm not surprised he doesn't want to show his tax returns because right. he's a real estate investor and his tax returns will probably show you that he doesn't pay any taxes. Uh, because he's a real estate investor and he's taking all those passive losses against his active income to not pay taxes. So we'll get into that. We have 45 minutes today, right, Vanessa? Yes, yes. Very short, uh, very short uh, segment here. And it's a very fun topic. So we should jump right in. It is. I'll make it as fun as possible. So um, there's two major categories I want to cover. One is just your average everyday homeowner that's not an investor. The second is uh, your investor, uh, someone who's going out there buying maybe a multifamily or commercial building. And let's discuss the tax implications on both. For this, as usual, I'm gonna split it over to my screen so I can share a PowerPoint here that I've put together. Um, now, Vanessa, I taught like a two hour long tax course on real estate back in April. We don't have two hours, but I'm using slides from the same presentation. So I might skip around this a little bit, okay? okay. Um, one thing I wanna really uh, make sure we, we cover though is these five segments that you see in front of you. Taxation in your residence, 
depreciation, cost segregation studies, 1031 exchanges, and step up cost basis. So what's this first one that we're talking about? That's taxation in your residence. Why should you understand taxation if you're just a homeowner? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, first and foremost, you get certain tax write-offs as a homeowner. Most people going out there buying homes are going to get a loan on their home. It used to be before this new tax bill came about, it used to be you could write off your interest associated with $1 million in loan amount. Now with the new tax law, you can write off interest associated with up to 750,000. For most of America though, we're not gonna be buying more than 750K of a home anyway. Um, places like San Diego, and perhaps if they're in Alaska, homes cost a bit more. But most of America, you'll be able to write off the majority, if not all, of the interest associated with your mortgage payment. That's automatically putting money in your pocket because you're paying less in taxes. We used to be able to write off up to $100,000 on a line of credit, also known as a HELOC, on our homes, but that is no longer. Um, and then I'm gonna skip that interest tracing for a minute, I'll get to that in a second, um, but let's talk about the $10,000 property tax and SALT tax limitation. SALT, Vanessa, stands for state and local taxes. So it used to be that you could write off on your federal tax return an unlimited amount of money proportionate to the taxes you paid to state and local income taxes, i.e. your state income tax that you paid every year through your job or your um, local real estate taxes that you were paying. That's now, now capped at $10,000. So that tax bill that was passed a couple of years ago became a little bit more restrictive on homeowners. However, it still made home ownership far more tax advantaged than renting property. Um, the tax bill, however, made it really loosened restrictions for investors. Investors can now write off even more than we used to be able to write off with that new tax bill. Bottom line though, for homeowners is owning, you get tax write-offs, renting, you do not. Any questions or comments on this before we move into investing, Vanessa? Nope. Okay, so let's talk about investing for a second. Is there a way that you can perhaps pull money out of your primary residence um, and not uh, above 750K or as a HELOC and still write that off? Absolutely. And that's called interest tracing. Um, so case in point, let's say here in San Diego, can you, you, can you, what the interest rate, interest tracing is, what's the definition of that? Interest tracing is um, tracing what asset is behind the purchase you made with the debt you pulled out. Let me give you an example. The best way to define interest tracing is an example. So let's say I go out and I buy a $750,000 home. And let's say I use a VA loan. So I put zero down, $750,000 loan for my primary residence. And I live in it for five years or 10 years. I've been able to write off every penny of my interest payment because it's no more than 750K. Now let's say 10 years later, my home is worth a million dollars. So I have $250,000, it's gone up in value. And I say to myself, you know what? I wanna go out and buy some investment real estate. We all know that the cheapest debt you can get, i.e. the debt with the lowest interest rate is going to be the debt behind your primary residence, the loan on your home. If I go out and I get a brand new loan on an investment property, my interest rate's usually gonna be about 1% higher than if I got a loan on my primary home. Now, don't get me wrong, I get loans on my investment properties all the time. But for this interest tracing example, I had a $750,000 home. It's now worth 1 million. And I'm gonna do a cash out refinance. So what is a cash out refinance? I get my home appraised for a million dollars 
and I get a brand new loan, in this case, a VA loan for a million dollars. That brand new VA loan for a million dollars pays off my old loan that I had for 750K. And well, what's a million minus 750K? 250,000. So now I've got $250,000 in my pocket, more accurately, in my checking account. If I go out and I spend that $250,000 on a vacation or on a boat or in Las Vegas or you name it, I cannot deduct the $250,000 um, interest payments, the interest payments associated with that $250K. For the last five years? Say again, Vanessa? For the last, retroactively, for the last five years? No, as soon as I pull that money out. Oh, got it, got it. Yeah. Okay. So now my loan is 750 k and 250 k I got a million dollar loan. And 750 k is, is, was used to purchase that home. That's it. The 250 k is just cash in my pocket. Right. If I'm smart and I use that 250 k to invest, i.e. if I use it to go buy an investment property, I go buy a duplex. And that 250K is my down payment on that duplex. And maybe the duplex is, I don't know, 600K. And the other 350K I take as a loan. Because I used the money on that cash out, be it a cash out refi or be it a HELOC, because I used it to buy an investment property, I can now deduct the interest associated with that 250K. That line of credit, okay, got it. That's right. So that's a way to do a line of credit against your primary residence. That's a way to do a cash out against your primary residence, a get above 750K and still write that interest all off. Because the limit to what you can write off is the 750 is what you, got Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, that's that's so, the, the federal limit is if you own a home that's like above a million dollars, you could only write off the interest on 100, 750,000. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I've got a client who's got a $1.3 million, uh, $1 million loan. $1.3 million loan on their primary residence. In a normal world, <laughs> well, in, if they, in a normal situation, they could only write off 750K of interest on that $1.3 million loan. So there would be, what is that, $550,000 of that loan interest associated with it that they wouldn't be able to write off. But this client, every dollar above 750 that they've pulled out up to 1.3 million, they utilize those dollars to go out and buy investment real estate. So they can continue to write off the interest associated with the loan backed by their primary residence because they use that cash out or that HELOC to go buy investment real estate. Got it. You look, you look a little confused. Right? No, no, but no. I'm in, responding to some things. I got it. Okay. Sorry. Copy that. And, and taxes, Vanessa, and for everyone out there, taxes are complicated. If you are a real no, estate. You're, you're explaining it. You're explaining it straightforward. It makes sense. Yeah, but, but what I do want to add on is if you're a real estate investor, you need a CPA. If you're a real estate investor and you think you can do it on your own, you can probably stumble through it on your own, but you will eventually make mistakes. Um, I know taxes pretty well, and even I hire a CPA because they know it. You might, you might have, like, like me, you might know it somewhat, but no one's going to know taxation as well as CPA. So find a CPA that specializes in real estate to ensure that you're doing this interest tracing. Um, instead of writing that, that all the interest off on your normal tax form, you're going to write that off on Schedule E for the property it's associated with. But you want to make sure you have an accountant to make sure you're tracing everything correctly and filing correctly. Right. And there is a uh, tax-free wealth, which is Robert Kiyosaki's uh, team there. Um, it's his CPA. They um, That author has like, uh, a, a, a directory where um, CPAs under his umbrella are um, 
they are versed in real estate investing and they know this very well, like more than your average CPA. So if you guys are looking for uh, someone that knows real estate, um, that is a really good resource to tap into. I forget his name off the top of my hand. Uh, who's the author of Tax Free Wealth? Remind me, Patrick, you should know. It's a, is it a female? I think it's a, no, it's a male. It's uh, it's Robert Kiyosaki's CPA guy. But anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to take up. That's, that's the reason why I'm trying to share our video and I can't get it shared. That's what I'm, I'm fighting with. No worries. Yeah, but, definitely vet who you worked with. I, I had to go through four accountants before I got to the one I'm at now. I uh, still have not found a, well, I have, I have a, t a tax guy. I trust a CPA girl that, that, that seems I, um, a bookkeeper girl that seems decent, but dang, it is freaking hard to find a good CPA and a tax person. Yep. It is really hard to find a CPA, especially a CPA that is both good and understands real estate taxation. And um, to me, I, I like, like when you give me a, a book recommendation, like I always ask you, Patrick, I hope it makes you laugh. Mm -hmm. When I'm like, do I need a master's degree in finance to read this book? Or is this going to mm -hmm. be something that, that is palatable for me to <clears throat> Assume, right a book that I'm not gonna like struggle to read three pages not because I can't comprehend it but because it's boring um, <laughs> um, but um, uh, and um, you know a CPA that can communicate in 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 terminology that actually makes sense and can keep me to what he's saying because I'd never like to just be like oh you know deal with it and I'm not going to think about it yeah because get in trouble doing that um in your especially in your taxes if you don't pay attention um but um so yeah that's why the the Robert Kiyosaki and I'll get I'll get the uh tax-free wealth guy's name here and I'll mention it yeah. but let's go on because I know we have a lot yeah and we've said it before Vanessa one of the primary reasons it, to invest in real estate is for the tax benefits of investing in real estate so if you're investing in real estate and you haven't spent time for all those out there studying the tax benefits, you're missing a huge portion of the reason to invest in real estate. And it's Tom Wheelwright um, and his CPA firm. Um, I'll find it. I'll, so is it WealthAbility? Um, anyway, he has a whole uh, like firm of CPAs underneath him in different parts of the country that that um, that are trained with um, you know with his principles and then teach real estate or no real estate well okay. awesome so the last thing i'm going to touch on vanessa before we move into investment is one last thing for just homeowners and for those realtors out there this is another thing to share with your buyers and your sellers um but i'll tell you what everything that we can invest in in america you are going to get taxed on except for two exceptions one municipal bonds, which will give you maybe like a 3% return in this day and age, like a 1% return. The other and the biggest one is your home. As a lot of you might already know, if you own a home that you live in, your primary residence, and you have lived in it for two of the last five years, when you sell that home, you can make up to a quarter million dollars all tax-free. If you're married, you can make up to a half million dollars tax free. I'm helping a married couple right now sell a home. They have over $400,000 equity in that home. Holy and God. when they sell it, they're making 400,000 scot free, no tax implications at all. Everything else you get taxed on, even retirement accounts. Retirement accounts are not tax free, they're tax deferred. This is the only investment where you can invest Live in your home for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and when you sell it, take all those profits tax-free. Vanessa, do you know any other investment that you can do that with? Negative. None. No, and that like, and that's and like you're helping people buy buy real estate, you know, and we, we, you know, when we're talking to them about like, especially as I help military service members, um, and you know that are high turnover and resale kind of people, when I tell them about you know the benefits of holding the property, um, you know it's one it's one of the few investment. I mean, it's the only investment vehicle that you can live in. You know that that. That, uh, I mean, it's it's basically like an IRA. I was just telling somebody um, because I said um, when you um, 
make an investment when 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 you're making an investment in IRA or when you're making an investment in your TSP, which is a military you know savings account. I said, do you expect to make a hundred thousand dollars in that in that you know first year? And they're like, no. I'm like, okay. The same with real estate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like it's mm -hmm. not, there's not a fast game unless you happen to get lucky in a recession and uh, get caught in a cycle that's appreciating, you know? Yeah. Look, I've, I've met some people and I've read in some books even that a house is a liability. Let's be very, very clear. A house is not a liability. A mortgage is a liability, but a house is an asset. Go talk to any CPA and they will tell you the same. A mortgage is a liability. A house is an asset. Now, when you rent, your monthly rent is a liability, but the building you're renting is not an asset because you don't own it. Why would you take on a liability if you can't also take on an asset? Why would you rent if you don't get to take on that asset? Because just as your monthly mortgage payment is a liability, so is your monthly rent payment. You have to live somewhere anyway. But those renters are not going to get this tax-free growth and be able to cash out on it tax-free later on. Um, now let's move into investment real estate. Anything you want to add about ownership of your personal property before you go into an investment? Nope, nope. Let me check questions. Oh, there is one. <laughs> And I'm skipping through some of this math for the sake of time. Can you use a real estate tax CPA in a different state? Yes, you can. Um, but I'm saying that with a stutter um, because but, can you use a CPA in a different state to do your taxes? Yes, of course you can. I'm keeping my I'm keeping my Alaska guy. So, however, comma. There's two taxes you file every year: your federal taxes and your state taxes. And um, typically your federal taxes are done and then the uh, accountant kind of looks at your federal forms to fill out your state forms. For your state tax form, it would behoove you to have a CPA that understands the tax laws in your state. What can you write, write off? What uh, can't you write off? State taxes. What's I mean, that? I mean, we only have property tax. That's the only tax we have. Yeah. I, um, that said, some CPAs specialize in multiple states, especially like where I live in California. We got CPAs that specialize in Nevada, Arizona, and California. Um, but yeah, I, the, the, your, your biggest tax form is going to be your federal tax form. And no matter which of the 50 states you're in, your CPA should understand that. But if you can find a good CPA in the state you live in, that's the best of both worlds. Now, let's move on and talk about investment real estate for a second. As I mentioned, the new tax law, um, well, it kind of tightened things up a little bit on homeowners. It loosened things dramatically for investors. Again, no surprise, Donald Trump's a, re a real estate investor. He's the one in office right now. He helped pass that tax law along with Congress. Um, but one of the biggest advantages we have to investing in real estate is depreciation. So what is depreciation? Again, I'm gonna explain it through an example. Let's say I go out and I buy a $1 million property, a fourplex. Um, in fact, I think I got a really good pie chart right here to explain it. If we go out and buy that $1 million fourplex, I have to differentiate between what is property and what is land, okay? The government, the IRS assumes that property goes down in value. Because let's be honest with ourselves, how many buildings that were built 300 years ago still stand? Some, but very few. Most buildings fall down after 100 years or so, or, or more accurately, they get demoed by us humans. We build something bigger and better. So the IRS says everything has a usable life. Now the IRS says that land has a usable life of infinity. Land is not going to ever go away, they say. But the buildings, the sidewalks, the fences, the oven that you put in last week, these things have a lifespan to them. What is that lifespan called? 
it's a depreciable lifespan. And what is depreciation? Depreciation is taking value off of something over a set amount of time. So if I go out and I buy a million dollar property, I might say, well, $300,000 is attributed to the land and $700,000 is attributed to the building, the sidewalks, the fences, the real property. So that $300,000 I cannot depreciate. The other $700,000 I can depreciate. And I'm um, going back to this slide, how do you depreciate that? Well, if it's a residential building, i.e. a building that people live in, it could be one unit, a single family home, up to four units, up to 400 units. Um, let's be clear, five units and above is commercial property, but five units and above multifamily is still residential in that people live in it. Mm -hmm. So a building people live in, you depreciate over 27 and a half years. Quite simply, you take the $700,000 attributed to the building, the sidewalk, the fences, and you divide that $700,000 by 27 and a half years. In this example, what do we get? Maybe $25,000, $30,000 a year. Um, if you take 700K divided by 27.5. In fact, let me get accurate, I'm pulling out my calculator. 700,000 divided by 27.5 is $25,454. So as a real estate investor, I buy this building and I'm able to deduct $25,000 a year from my income that I'm making off of this building. Am I really losing $25,000 a year? Negative. Not at all. Negative. I mean, it literally goes to your cash flow. Yeah. Exactly. It goes to your cash flow. Um, well, it's written oh, off against right. well, your cash flow. So if I make, yeah, because you make twenty five thousand, Vanessa, you don't I, get taxed on any of it. Right. And when I am calculating my investment cash flow, and we are making reserves for our taxable income, and when people are, you know, cash flow focused, which a lot of investors are. Um, this depreciation opportunity and this, you know, it, or the, 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 the cost of the transfer of this liability goes against literally my cash flow for that year. I mean, how does it not? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So every, every year you get to take this phantom write-off. I call it a phantom write-off because you're not really losing $25,000. Let's be clear, you're not losing $25,000. You're just being able to write off that depreciation schedule of it. Now, if you buy commercial real estate, like an office building, retail, or a warehouse, industrial, that gets depreciated over 39 years. So every, every year, you get to take this phantom write-off. I call it a phantom write-off. I can hear myself talking back. Can you hear that, Vanessa? Let's be clear, you're not losing twenty. <laughs> That's cool. Um, anyway, you're writing off that amount every year, even though you're not losing it. Now, there's something called um, cost segregation. Have you heard of cost segregation before, Vanessa? I've I've heard of cost segregation, like on Bigger Pockets. Um, I think I've read a few books, but I never took advantage of it until this year. What is cost segregation? Well, instead of writing off $25,000 per year, what if you could write off 30, 40, 50, $60,000 a year, pushing some of those later year write-offs forward, i.e., instead of writing it off in year 25, 26, 27, writing it off in year one, year two, year three, year four, you'd rather take those, those phantom write-offs earlier than later. So the government allows something called a cost segregation study to be done. A cost segregation study simply allocates how much cost is allocated to the real property, i.e. the building, versus how much is allocated to land improvements, things like landscaping, sidewalks, parking lots, and how much is allocated to personal property. Things like carpeting, decorative lighting, uh, millwork, electrical, plumbing, that special, maybe your oven or your, your fridge that you put in there. And most, not all, but most cost segregation studies will likely break up 
the value of that 700K into a pie chart similar to what you see in front of you right now. So if $700,000 is allocated to depreciable assets, and of that 700K, about 45, 45% we can write off right away immediately in the first five, seven, or 15 years, that allows us to take those bigger tax write-offs up front instead of later on. What does that mean for you? You're paying less taxes. Just bottom line, you're paying less taxes. But something happened with the new tax bill that was approved a couple of years ago now that makes what you see in front of you even more beneficial. The new tax bill allows us investors, all the stuff on the left side of this pie chart in the red and the blue, we can now write that off the year that we acquire the property. So instead of having to write it off over five, seven or 15 years, you write it all off in year one. As another um, case. And what happens well, when you sell that asset? Because this <clears throat> to me sounds like, you know, when we, when we take it to be <clears throat> premium pricing and loans and I take a higher interest rate to pull cash out and then I like refinance it in a year and um, I just like walked away with 10 grand in my pocket from the lender um, and I fixed my interest rate and now I, I kind of stole money like I knew I was doing it right so like when when you're in, in this model, when you're taking the depreciation on an asset that maybe I know I'm only going to hold for three years, or maybe I'm going to flip it, or maybe I'm going to do something to it, you know, um, and what happens if you sell the property? That's a good question. And we'll get into that in just one second. I'm going to go through different sales scenarios because it's highly dependent on what you do with your proceeds after you make that sale. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, Right before we get to that though, let's talk through a little case study on this as well, because I like going by examples. I've got another client who bought, again, a million dollar property. I like using these million dollar examples. And and really quick, no. this, uh, Maxwell's asking this question, and this is another, a, a really good secondary question, and it fits yeah. in here. It's like, um, what is, when you need more write-offs like the following year, but you took all of them the first year, like what, like the depreciation, he's saying, what are, what about the years after when you need more write-offs? So let's say uh, in any given year, you take a, let's say you take a $100,000 write-off on depreciation and you only use $80,000 of it, you can carry that forward. So whatever losses you don't use, you can carry forward. I believe that you can also carry them backwards two years but double check with your CPA on that. Everything I'm saying, again, like I, I, I know, okay. I like to always say I know enough to be dangerous, um, but everything I'm saying, don't take what Patrick said, don't use me as your CPA, because I'm not a CPA, don't take what I said, and then go do your own taxes. He's, he's a realtor, yeah. Oh, perfect, yeah, take what I said, and what I say, make it make you more curious, curious enough to go hire a CPA and say, this crazy guy, Patrick, told me I could not pay taxes by doing depreciation. Can you be my CPA and make sure I do it right? <laughs> but, but yeah, you can carry your losses forward if you have leftover losses. Now, a guy like me, um, I, I, I do this and I take all kinds of losses and I carry them forward. But next year, I need some more losses. I'm using all my losses up. I'm using all my depreciation up. So what do you think I'm going to do next year, Vanessa, to get some more losses? Buy another piece of real estate. Absolutely. I'm going to buy another piece of real estate next year to get more losses. Um, even though they're gains, even though I'm making money on everything I buy, it's these phantom losses through depreciation. But so for this case study, let's say you go out and buy $1 million piece of property. I can give you some very, uh, I'll give you a good odds that of that $1 million property, probably 50% maybe a little bit more is going to be attributed to the building and the rest of the land. Um, it's going to vary based on where you buy it, California versus North Dakota, different markets. But of the total purchase price, I've kind of come to find as a rule of thumb, about 25% of the total purchase price is going to be allocated to these items in red and blue, land improvements, personal property, and not ironically, about 25% of total purchase price is your down payment. 
So I've come to find that it kind of lines up nicely that your down payment is almost going to be a 100% tax write off the year you buy it. Um, with that said, make sure you hire a company to do your cost segregation study. This isn't something that you go out and do on your own. And they're not cheap either. They're not. They, they can be. Um, There's some companies that will tell you, oh, it's going to be $5,000 a property. I've come to find that if you do a full-blown cost segregation study, they come out, they have engineers, they look at your property, they do all the analysis, you're gonna spend between four to six K per property. But if you have a smaller property, i.e. a million dollars and below, you can hire a company that'll do what's called a desktop cost segregation study. They okay. don't even visit your property. It's a lot like a desktop appraisal. And that for me ended up being maybe around a thousand dollars a property, two thousand at the most. If anyone needs connection to a cost segregation study, email me, I'll get you connected. Um, and I have a company that does both in person and desktop, dependent on the property. And hey guys, um, can I get a can I get a like thumbs up of like or a hand raise if you would like like the thorough <clears throat> class that uh, Patrick teaches on this because i know we're kind of like moving through this quickly because um we got 45 minutes on lab coats um give me a thumbs up or a like or say yes i'm interested um uh, because we um we might push through lab coating um lab coats the opportunity to do like a not live web uh like just a webinar a class that patrick teaches all the time so um we can we can also look at that i just want to kind of gauge interest uh, if you're really looking at more in-depth um, give me a chat and uh, we can see about putting that together. I'd say if I get at least like 30 to 40 people that want to jump in on your, your longer class, we can put it together. Okay, yeah, as I said, it's a two hour class. We go deep into this. I know I've only got about six minutes left here. Um, and oh we got like, yeah. So um, let's wrap this up. Um, cost segregation study. Hopefully that got you at least interested in looking more into it. If we do that two hour class, we'll discuss it more in depth. I, I did cost segregation studies on all my properties this January, reduced my tax liability tremendously, losses to carry forward. Um, we can go like 11 minutes, we can go a <clears throat> Copy that. Now depreciation, this is very important folks. That new tax bill that was passed a few years ago, um, you can do 100% bonus depreciation through the year 2022. Remember how I said this stuff in red and blue, you can write off 100% of it on year one, the year you acquire it. That sunsets in 2022, as you see in this chart. And it goes from 100% write off in year one to 80% write off in year one to 60% to 40 to 20 to none, based on the years you see on the left. That's why me, Vanessa, I am buying as much real estate as humanly possible between now and 2022 because I am taking advantage of this bonus depreciation, which starts to sunset in 2023, not to mention the low rates we have right now. That's crazy. There's multiple reasons that make right but now the best time to buy real estate. In, in like the history of our country. Like What's that? In, in the history of our country. Well, yeah, we've, we, in my lifetime, we haven't had this, at no. least not in my investing lifetime. So folks take advantage of this. There is about just over what, 30 months of this left. There's 30 months of this left. Um, and then it starts to sunset. And a lot of people say it's a good time to buy because of low interest rates. They don't even talk about the tax implications. This is quantitatively showing you how good it is to buy each year and showing you up to 2022 is the best. Um, now, cost segregation study, investment calculations is all stuff that we can get into in a two hour per class, tax brackets, we get into that on the tax code, how to avoid taxes 100%. Now I just skipped ahead like 30 minutes to show you, Vanessa, what happens when you sell the property? I wanna to get to your question. <clears throat> well, it depends. A you know, um, guy like me, I try not to sell property. It's a Burr method, right? Buy, rehab, rent, refi. Mm -hmm. um, I.e., I don't like to sell. I like to get oh. money out of it, but not by selling it, but by doing that cash out refi. So Take I do option. Yep. I do the option in the middle here, and I do that cash out refi. Now, if you just sell the property and put your money in your pocket, Vanessa, the appreciation on that property is going to get taxed at these top rates: zero, fifteen, twenty percent. 
And we can dive into those deeper on the two hour class. However, the depreciation you've taken is going to get taxed. Gosh, I don't even wanna, it, it, I, I wanna say it gets taxed around like 20, 25%. It is going to get taxed at a higher rate than this zero to 15. It's still going to get taxed lower than maybe your ordinary income tax rate is, depending on how much you make ordinarily and what's your income tax bracket. But that depreciation will get ta taxed. It will, get, it will catch up to you. But most real estate investors will not get taxed on that depreciation write-off ever because most real estate investors are going to either do the cash out refi to get their money out or if they do sell, they're going to do a 1031 exchange, swap till you drop. And we could do a whole class on 1031, but let's close up the last five minutes here, just doing a short version of what's a 1031 and how are you not going to get taxed even on that depreciation. We all know what a cash out refi is, but this 1031 exchange, let's say I buy a single family home and I depreciate it over five, 10, 15 years, I've depreciated a couple hundred thousand dollars. If I sell it, I'm going to have to pay long-term capital gains tax on my appreciation, and I'm going to have to pay taxes on my depreciation write-offs I've been doing. But instead of just putting the money in my pocket, I take my proceeds and I do a 1031 exchange, and I go out and buy a duplex. And I own that duplex for 10 years. And I sell that, and I take my proceeds, and I buy a triplex. And I own that for 10 years, and so on and so forth. You get, you get the situation here. So every year or every five, every 10, every 15 years, I'm selling a property and buying a property of equal or greater value. Then right. one day I'm 90 years old. I'm going to die when I'm 90, Vanessa. I'm 90 years old and I started out with this 500K property and I now have a $2.5 million multifamily property. If I sell that $2.5 million multifamily the day before I die, I would be an idiot because I am going to pay taxes on all of the gain between this 500K property and this 2.5. But if I don't sell it before I die and I instead leave it to my family or my heirs or charity, my family, <clears throat> excuse me, my heirs can sell that property for 2.5 million and get what's called a step up cost basis. Guess what a step up cost basis is, Vanessa? It's exactly what it sounds like. The IRS pretends. You notice the IRS has a lot of make believe. You think a five year old plays in a fantasy make believe land? No, the IRS does. And the <laughs> IRS has a make believe fantasy land that favors real estate investors and the wealthy. Our, I'm not, I'm not going to like sugarcoat things. Our system is set up for the wealthy, especially real estate investors. When this individual dies, with a two and a half million dollar asset and they leave it to their kids, the IRS pretends that the kids just bought it for two and a half million. So if their cost basis, it pretends they acquired it at a cost of two and a half. So if they sell it for two and a half million dollars a day after your funeral, how much do they have to pay in taxes? Zero. Because they got it for two and a half. They bought it. They acquired it. Their tax basis is two and a half. So they now don't have any gain that they made on it. Whereas if you sold it the day before you died, you have a $2 million gain. Um, so don't sell right before you die. First die and then let your kids sell it. That's a smart <laughs> way to do it. Um, and it's all tax free. If you leave your kids a retirement account, they're going to have to pay taxes on it. Uh -huh. they pull money out of that 401k. Buy them a house. But in this case, no taxes. So how do you get your money out of it? You see here on the bottom, little squiggly lines. These are all cash out refis. So you just live your life on your yacht, traveling the world on Carnival Cruise Line or whichever one you prefer by so doing these. You don't these pay tax. taxes on your cash out refis. <clears throat> What's that? So you don't pay the taxes the, the, the same price. Yeah, you don't pay taxes on a cash out refi. It's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. So this is how you make millions of dollars without paying taxes on it. And you pull the money out of the millions of dollars without paying taxes on it. And you've depreciated all this stuff, making up phantom losses that are not real losses <laughs> to not pay taxes on your cash flow. You're just not paying taxes. It is crazy. Does it, it, and then when you I, pass it to your kids, they don't pay taxes. Absolutely. 
There is, guys, I have been, I got my first job in fifth grade. I was a paper boy in North Dakota, like one of the hardest states to have a, a, a paper route in because of <laughs> Um, I'm like, that just, that just dawned on me. I was like, Patrick and North Dakota in the winter delivery. Yeah, I was a fifth grader, paper route. It was a 10 block route and I would walk five blocks and I literally, at block five, I dug a huge hole in the ground. Like the snow banks are 10 feet high. So my hole in the ground is big enough for me to crawl inside of. I would crawl in there for 10 minutes and I would warm up in this little hole in the ground. And then I would crawl back out and do the next five blocks in my paper route because it's like negative 10 degrees in North Dakota in January. But I made $100 a month. And my dad said, if you take $50, I will match your $50 and invest it in the stock market. So I began investing in the stock market. I had an IRA before I graduated high school. And I learned the benefits of retirement accounts, tax deferred retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, TSP. However, when in my 20s, I learned that real estate has far more tax benefits than the best 401k does, than the best IRA, than the best TSP. Real estate has far more tax benefits and it grows faster and makes you wealthier. That's so amazing. No, and I, I love the, what, the way you break this down because it is mind blowing. And I know we have a ton of questions and guys, we're gonna get caught, cut off like in two minutes because there's another uh, sponsored webinar right after this in Lab Code Agents. So what we're gonna do, um, I know we have your registrants. Um, um, I will do my best if I can to get some of these questions answered. Um, uh, feel free, I don't, you can, you can Patrick with your questions just kidding but we will get signed up we're gonna I'll have Tristan and the team uh, push out a request for that two-hour class uh, we got a lot of people commenting and interested on that but again um, I uh, you know I'm happy to we're happy to deliver this. We really, really enjoy helping people learn how to take the advantages that they can with real estate investing, especially for us real estate professionals that are like in the midst of it. We should know this stuff. So um, super, super happy. But Patrick, if you don't have anything more, I'm going to jump off. Yeah. Double check everything with your CPA, folks. I'm not a CPA. I'm just a, a realtor that's been to school. Uh, but double check everything in your CPA <laughs> and hopefully we can do like a two hour class and go deeper into this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, cool. You guys have an amazing Wednesday and we will talk, no, Thursday, just kidding. And we'll talk to you soon. See you, Vanessa. Bye. Bye.